Beep boop intro music. Welcome to Decipher Sci-Fi, where every week we watch a sci-fi movie and then talk about the themes and ideas from the film. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. Hey Lee. Hey Chris. What movie did we watch? We watched Lawnmower Man. Lawnmower Man. Yes, Lawnmower Man. That was it. It was a movie directed by Brett Leonard in 1992. Spoiler alert. We're going to spoil the movie. Colbert, tell me more about it. It is Flowers for Algernon meets Oculus Rift. And there's a couple other things thrown in, but that's primarily it. Uh, So the summary of the plot is Pierce Brosnan is an unethical researcher who gives super intelligence to a mentally disabled man who mows lawns. Well, yes, he happens to be available. And then hilarity ensues. Well, it's not hilarious. (laughs) There's a lot of virtual reality that's in use. Oh, yeah, there's some virtual reality in this movie. We'll get to that. First thing, talk about the movie a little bit and some issues that it had. Stephen King wrote a book called Lawnmower Man. So when I found that out, I was like, oh, snap, Stephen King wrote another book that was a movie that I like that it turns out was Stephen King. Sometimes I'm surprised by this because Stephen King wrote so many books that there's actually just like a ton of movies from his books. It's hard to keep track. However, in this case, only the title is shared. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's that's the trick here. So he actually sued the makers of the film for stealing the title and not taking anything else. That was a weird mashup. They were like, we have the script and there's this other title and we'll just put them together. It'll be great. And it might have been great. It might not have been great, but it had nothing to do with Stephen King's book. It was so great they were sued. So yeah, and I'm pretty sure he won. Wait, yeah, he actually won a lawsuit in the end it was over like that. Ten grand and there profits if they went ahead and used it i thought or something like that i have no idea did you just make that up yeah if it sounds good (laughs) i have no (laughs) idea moving on so the director who may have had something to do with the choice of the movie's title good job he went from here to direct virtuosity which was another early 90s virtual reality film and unfortunately the choice of films that he has gotten involved with didn't age well so either the terms are seen kind of uh Whimsically now, when you look backwards, and the effects that were groundbreaking at the time just haven't held up at all. Right. It did the movie thing where the techno babble might not make sense, which is okay. It always happens. I'm not really going to hold it against anything. And that's where I've always been a fan of practical effects. They hold up very well. I mean, you can go back and watch Jurassic Park, and there's nothing glaring that's going to pull you out of it. Right. So Jurassic Park was 1994-ish. It was a couple years after this, maybe, whatever it was. And it looks great. And it looks great now. And like you said, I think it's a, a big part of that was they used practical effects. There was a lot of puppetry going on mixed with CG in a very intelligent way, in a very smooth way, and they also had a much larger budget, and they had Steven Spielberg, and that's how you get an awesome movie that lasts 25 years and looks awesome. Yeah, and this just, this just helps to show that CGI, and especially in this case, doesn't age well. It didn't age well, It which is fine. You can't hold it against it, but being at the cutting edge of that at the time, I wonder if they knew, like, one day, this stuff's gonna look good, which will make this stuff look bad. But I guess... Movie makers probably don't think often about their decades-long legacy of a film, do they? No, it's art. It's fine. Yeah, and if you look at the box office results, it was a success. Oh, right, yeah, and at the time it was like. Do you remember your impressions at the time? Because I know I saw it, I remember seeing the movie, I remember thinking it was pretty cool. It was actually too far back, I don't have memories. No? No. I saw it on, on, like, rental VHS a little later, I'm not sure how old it was, but I was a little kid, under 10. I remember watching it, I just don't remember much more than that. In fact, not under 10. I was a little kid... Maybe like 10, 12 years old or something. Yep. So it apparently cost about $10 million and it took in 32-ish around that. Something like that. So big success. But to think about how much it cost to do all this stuff, a lot of that must have been the CG. You would think so. I would. And also, I mean, think of how much effort and time and man hours and computing hours went into producing this thing that is kind of laughable now, to be honest. Although it's kind of hard to guesstimate backwards. I mean, we have large studio houses that are dedicated to making incredible feats of CGI nowadays. Oh, millions and millions of dollars. Whereas back in the day, I'm imagining they were much smaller houses, just like a small team of people. Dude, think about it this way. You could go and get Blender and download a a Creative Commons human model and do that. Pretty much make all the CG from this whole movie now. I'm pretty sure I could just do it on my phone. You might even be able to do it on your phone. That's like, did you see the episode of Community where they sort of lampooned Landmower Man and the VR stuff of the 90s in general? I have seen all of the episodes of Community. That one in particular I really liked, and it's relevant to what we're talking about. It was so funny. And to think about someone on staff there probably said, I'll do it, I guess, and just use like stock mo- human model and a bunch of and a bunch of shape primitives, really, to put the whole thing together. I'm, I'm not going to say trivial to put that together, but... Comparatively trivial to the Comparatively effort. trivial and literally cheap and easy. It's cr- incredible how long, how far we've come that community could put that community's whole budget is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for an episode. And they pulled off the stuff that Lawnmower Man pulled off for 10 million in 1992. It's, it's great. The tools that have developed and what we have available now. But they didn't have Pierce Brosnan in their episode. So 
he may have pulled a, a chunk of that money. So again, this is 1992. We need to remember the environment at the time. For reference, 1992, the world of 3D video games was Wolfenstein 3D. That was it. They actually had a, a game that worked out some of those ideas that they used in Wolfenstein before Wolfenstein. But it, no one knows about it, and it was not good. But it had ray tracing, 3D hallways with 2D sprites floating around trying to attack you. It was like Magic of Monsters. Uh, this is the age of Wolfenstein and not having multitasking in your in your computers. Because DOS, no kidding. This is even, this is two years before the PlayStation came out. So I was thinking, and this, we were watching this movie, like, oh, uh, I'd say it's to compare to something that everyone would be able to recognize pre-PlayStation graphics, but not even. Well, like, the Super Nintendo was released around this time. The Super Nintendo was out for sure. And the Super Nintendo did have, at this point, the 3D chip in, game like, in games like Star Fox, now that you mention it, which didn't look as good as this movie. Well, that would be quite amazing for a couple of years span. Right, right. But uh, that was actually a good. It's a good point. We did have games before Wolfenstein on the PC that were pulling off a 3D thing. It's not quite the same technology as Wolfenstein was employing, but important because it was representing a 3D world. But you weren't in the 3D world. It would have been about 1994 when I remember seeing virtual reality games in arcade settings where you put on the headset and stand in the thing and maybe put some gloves on or hold a gun. Did you ever do any of those? No, I don't. Outside of the tank game where you like stand in the middle and then you can spin around. That sounds fun too. There's a turret game, something like that. Ah, I was in, I recall a, a game where I stood inside, I'm not sure what to call a harness. Not even harness. Put into a little fenced off area, given the gun thing, the controller, and then wore a headset. And seeing movies like Lone War Man, I was pretty pumped up. I was going to go 3D. I was going to virtual reality. And it was going to be incredible. And maybe I'll like bring about the singularity. But it turned out it was just lame. It was just really not cool at all. And that's what we had. Well, it'll never match up to your imagination. Although it nowadays, might. the hardware required wasn't available to the average consumer to have 3D graphics. I think Wolfenstein itself was a little bit intensive. It had like 33 megahertz requirement. Yeah, which at the time like a would have shared 8 megabyte RAM or something like that. Not to mention the expertise to be able to configure your IRQs to make everything not explode. People don't even know what that means anymore. It means interrupt request. 1992, we had some stuff though. So Star Fox was on Nintendo, it had that chip. And then the Sega CD was out in 1992. Did you notice how like they were featuring CDs in the movie? Like it was cool technology stuff? It was a cool technology. I don't know, man. I have a hard time remembering that. If anything, I remember them being coasters. And now I remember them being a thing that are dusty in the closet because why would I use physical media? It's incredible how far we've come. Because 10 years ago, that was the thing. 10 years ago? Yeah, you still had CDs. In oh, use. oh. But then 20 years ago, definitely. Because CDs were used for music already for since like the early 80s. So this isn't a big deal at the time the movie came out. But it is featuring it as like the symbol of technology and data and ooh, big computers. Yeah, just like Laserdisc. Those giant platter-sized CDs that were supposed to be awesome for movies or other media. We mentioned this in another recording. Don't remember what show it was. And I want to find a show to talk about Laserdisc in more detail. I'm assuming it was Demolition Man. Was it Demolition Man? That's my assumption. I don't remember. Anyway, and I mentioned offhandedly that they were analog, not digital, technically. And I want to get into that. But I don't know if that was the time. Because it has so little to do with anything. There was Sega CD, and then the 32X. You might have seen that picture. I know you've seen that picture, Colbert, where it's a Sega Genesis with like a 32X in it, and then a Sega CD, and then a Game Genie, and it's this giant, crazy stack of Sega consoles stacked up on each other like five feet high. Yeah, Show notes, this. decipherscifi.com slash nine. And that was what was cool in 1992. Well, yeah, so as a kid, the virtual reality that was available to you was never going to live up to what you imagined it would be. All right, so let's talk about, at the time, what VR was supposed to be about, because it was really exciting. I would imagine it being closer to what Second Life is nowadays, to what you might have imagined as, as back in the day, where you could just go in and you could create stuff, and then you could fly around if you wanted to and make things. Yeah, you know what? I didn't think of Second Life, but we've pretty much realized the thing that we were dreaming about in 1992, and it's not that great. Yeah, just put a headset on and some gloves and then control Second Life, and there you go. That's. I'm sure someone has done this already. So, And it's still around, and it still has a large user base, just, huh. It's just fallen out of the, you know, main well, the virtual reality perception. The, the virtual reality headset part just doesn't matter. Like it, it turns out for that application, what's valuable there is other people and interacting with other people in a world. It doesn't seem to matter that it's on a screen and not on your face. Yes. It's probably actually just a hindrance to have to put on a dumb headset. Being a god of your own world. So that's what we're imagining in 1992. And we're kind of there. And it turns out it wasn't that important. It wasn't that world changing. Did we think people would be smarter like Job? Were we going to put on a headset and learn like Neo in the Matrix? I don't think that was ever believed. 
I think people thought it would be much more interactive or novel than it actually turned out to be. Instead of the decade and a half of trying to shovel it into as many applications as possible and failing, I thought it would just kind of naturally grow and be this thing. Yeah, I guess we didn't have the infrastructure available to really make it awesome at the time. No, and any application where it did kind of get applied, it wasn't efficient or it wasn't as fun as other formats. So that was the early 90s. We thought it was going to be amazing, maybe change the world. Some people would say, turned out not to happen. But we got a lot going on right now. I think the main part is that the cost to enter has drastically lowered, where it's going to be available to anyone who wants to. Not uh, just be not in only it. not only has the cost lowered to a point where it's actually affordable, but the technology exists. We didn't have screens this light and this small before, for instance. We didn't have the hardware to have this low latency sensor interactivity before. Well, I'm saying you don't need to be able to afford a warehouse and yep. then all the other technologies to fit into it to create an actual entertaining and involved experience. Right. So we've come a long way. Thanks, iPhone. So now we have all this stuff that is available and cheap and affordable and able to go into an Oculus Rift. All the accelerometers and gyrometers and whatever's in there. Who knows? Yeah. The, the screens that are high resolution enough, affordable enough, and light enough to go on your face. Like your phone, for instance, and some cardboard. Yeah. It's released I, by a certain company we're all uh, familiar with. Exactly. So that's a cool thing. So first, internet should know. We should introduce people who are listening who might not be aware. Oculus Rift is a 3D headset that is still in development, but it's almost here. It's looking like it'll cost like 1500 bucks to have that and a computer to do stuff. Mostly video games, it seems like at this point, right? Well, that's going to be the big driver. So like I mentioned, Google Cardboard is another way that people are taking advantage of this. So Google was saying, hey, it's probably someone's 2% project or 20% project, who knows, where they were saying, oh, we could spend $1,500 on all this stuff, or I could just put my smartphone inside of a block of cardboard on my face and like duct tape it around my head. And they said, oh, wait, it actually works. This is amazing. Nice and low tech. It's It's cheap. cheap. And that's called a cardboard. It's almost like a joke. But no, literally, like they gave it away at the developer conference. Here's a piece of cardboard, fold along that a line and put it on your face. How cool. You figure the positioning is the important part. But otherwise, almost everyone has this expensive chunk of technology that just sits in their pocket. Right. And now, doing everything. so you take your phone plus some cardboard and two lenses. Actually, is really important and also doesn't work. But that's a couple bucks. And you have a virtual reality experience that you don't need to spend thousands on. Have you tried any of this stuff? Have you tried the Oculus or the cardboard before? No, I haven't. Have you? No. Why not? I don't have any money. (laughs) (laughs) You have a phone. I know you do. (laughs) I have a phone. Actually, yeah. So I've used the Google Cardboard and that I put it in front of my face and walked around and did the software without the Google Cardboard on it. And it was kind of cool. I haven't used Oculus at all. And if any of the listeners want to like buy us one so we can try it out, that'd be just fine. In fact, if you want to buy two, that'd be even better. (laughs) It'd be even better. I'm sure someone out there has a development model that they're not using and they should probably give it to us for great science. But Cardboard, pretty cool. Google put out a couple of cinematic experiences so that's one thing we should talk about here one thing that vr is going with now is immersive sort of cinematic experiences which has been tried in other various formats to less success i remember when they tried to do smell a vision for movies and that didn't work out no didn't work out at all they would create specific scents uh at first it was they would pump scents into the into the movie theater but it would all just get mingled because you couldn't flush it out fast enough (laughs) or if they had the card specifically oh oh scratch and sniff yeah that you could scratch to make it totally terrible and not worth it yeah yeah so hopefully virtual reality isn't like that so i guess that is virtual reality in a sense right we have other senses Mm -hmm. besides sight and sound that we should probably consider you have many many senses so without the smelling stuff which sounds like a terrible idea i've watched all of the 3d immersive movies that google put out for the phone uh three of them were cartoon which were fun and interesting and not something i would buy any hardware for but then there was also the something that might be something more Google got Jason Lin, who directed Fast and Furious 7, and maybe other ones too, to direct a sci-fi alien attack movie called Help. It was like, it might have been like 10 minutes long, where you're basically in a rail shooter, but you're not shooting. So camera's going along, 360 camera, between people running away from a monster and a monster. It was basically what happened for the whole time. And I, I, I was really disappointed. I wasn't blown away by it. Was that wasn't immersive enough for you, or it just failed to grab you? Like maybe if I had a whole headset and ear pieces in and the whole thing, but I feel like maybe it was just this application I'm not sure about, the movie thing, because I might actually prefer to have a director of photography decide what I'm looking at and the way I'm looking at it. Having the ability to move my head back and forth to look at the monster or the people. And it was just, I didn't know what to look at. I, I, I think I'd rather have it curated. I'm not sure. Maybe there's an application where I'd want to have freedom of movement. This wasn't it. Or there may be some application where you have specific audio cues to naturally draw your vision to specific events that happen in these. So you can have kind of the mix of freedom of will to choose where you look and curated events. Right. This is pretty much the very first time anyone was doing this sort of thing. So we'll see how it shakes out. 
I want I, w- I wanted to be more impressed, and I was just wishing I was watching a, a movie on the screen instead. Well, I would say the first, if anything, probably isn't going to impress right away. Now, I wasn't blown away by Help, which was the name of the thing I put in mention it. Help. I wasn't blown away by Help, the Google Justin Lin joint. But something that looks interesting that might be a really good use of this sort of thing the guy who made our music, the awesome dude, sent me an article, as he does. He's a really good curator of things that interest me, it turns out. He sent me an article. There are charities using virtual reality 3D movies to put rich, detached people into situations so they appreciate the humanity of others and donate at a cocktail party. And they set up this like seat where it comes sit down and put the headset on and like have an experience. And it apparently the initial results are looking pretty good. And if they continue to get results that make it worth it, I can see this happening a lot more and a lot bigger. But what they basically had was, so they used a 3D, uh, not a 3D camera, but a fully 360 degree everywhere camera, whatever it is, to film these very somber scenes of like destruction and war torn Africa and people starving, whatever. The things that you can imagine seeing in a documentary making a plea for money, which wouldn't surprise you. But to have it where someone who really was not empathizing could put on this headset and see and hear in a way that really draws them in and makes them feel something and then open up their wallet to help people, that sounds pretty cool. Like, I'd really like to see that sort of thing succeed. Maybe that's where we'll, we'll, the VR will have great utility is in... Reducing the size of the world. Reducing, reducing the size otherness. of the world. That's not where I was going to go, but basically, yes. I was going to say just... In, in helping humans well, uh, experience each other's experience. The largest part of isolation is being distant from others. So decreasing that distance would mm-hmm. help to... The emotional distance. You being able to other those events. Being able to experience the effects of a tsunami first person versus just seeing a clip of it on the news for 10 seconds. It's going to have drastically different effects on you. So like I said, they were seeing some positive beginning results here and it's pretty cool. And I hope to see more people play around with that and... If more people get helped, if it drives more people to help more people, that would be pretty cool. I'm into it. So that's where VR is now. It's on the cusp of maybe being something huge. Right now, it already is big money. Like, how much did Facebook buy Oculus Rift for? Billions? It was a lot of money. It was a lot. A lot. It was a lot more than I'll ever see. In fact, it was a Kickstarter, right? Hell of a success story. That's where VR is now. What is the future going to be? Well, maybe you'll wind up like in Wally. Everyone's uh, in their chair, just floating around, has everything done for them. If you want to go visit something, you go visit it virtually. You have virtual experiences. I don't know about that. You also have the Bruce Willis where you actually pilot an avatar so you don't have to leave your, your room. And you treat the real world like a virtual reality. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not get carried away. We got to do that movie separate from this movie. <laughs> I, I hadn't been thinking about it, but that'll be a fun one. Actually, sort of related by VR. What I was actually... I took a minute to think about this. because well, uh, how yeah. far into the future do you want to look? That's the question. That is the question. So I mean, start... currently, virtual reality tours of stuff is the thing. You can go look at buildings that you may not have been able to go see in person and do the full 360 tour, and zoom in on pieces of it. Yes. So before we go way into the future, I have something that we're doing now, we humans, not we, you and I, that might suggest where things are going. So NASA has a VR lab. And I'm thinking maybe industry is the place where we'll really see VR take off first. Who knows? But VR, the VR lab at NASA is where they are training people to do things that they could not actually train them to do in real life, other than actually doing it, like repairing the space station. Well, they have giant underwater like training areas they do. that they use for that currently. They use that. And then I guess it's not enough because they also use the virtual reality train. Like you don't have space and a space station extra on Earth. Well, the more tools in your tool belt, the better you're able to address problems. Yeah. And also they were able to get into this game earlier than we're seeing like the Oculus and whatnot because they didn't have the same requirements that we do mostly for video gaming and for immersive experience. The thing with the training they're doing at NASA was if you're floating in space and repairing the space station, and that's your VR experience training, you don't need the latency, the low latency that we need to play a video game. There's naturally a disconnect between your, your actions. Well, there doesn't, it's, it's that the delay is not a problem because they're floating slowly and moving very slowly in space and it doesn't actually affect the experience. More important to them was the higher resolution. That's what they were, they were able to, they were able to concentrate differently than these products that are being aimed at the consumer market. And they've, as a result, they've been doing this longer and in a different way than Oculus or whoever else is on the market. You can see it as a natural extension of the flight simulators that they're use mm-hmm. for the shuttle except it's a floaty fixie simulator so maybe that's the first place we're going to see great development is in industry and in training for crazy dangerous expensive whatever things that we can't just do for practice until we have a holodeck which is going to be a long ways off because that's a level of tactile feedback that is impressive that yeah will, i'm not sure that, some serious technology i'm not sure the star trek ever adequate adequately explained how their holodeck was supposed to work unfortunately 
I'm sure there was some techno babble. Yeah, I think it might have to have been hard light or something like that. Blah, blah, whatever. Mainly, you got to be careful that you don't let your sentient AI computer characters out to take over the world. Yeah, where, you know, actually just to walk out the door, and now it's a problem. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Like, it's a physical sandbox that you have to Very, <laughs> very basic security protocols that they seem to have overlooked in their holodeck. We'll have to be very careful. Luckily, it is a long way off. You also have awesome situations, like Captain Picard having the Tommy gun shooting the Borg. I'm not sure if I've talked about it on the podcast before, but there's a series of novels that I've been enjoying. I haven't finished it. The first one was called Altered Carbon, and it was this gritty sci-fi noir detective thing. But part of the world that was interesting, because it was actually a really thoroughly realized textured world, and I enjoyed it. That's one of the things I enjoy most about science fiction. Part of the world that was just a normal thing in this book, in this series, was VR. In the series, in this world, consciousnesses are portable. They can be taken out of a person, put into a computer. It's it's almost trivial to put it into VR instead. So imagine it's used as a device in the plot a number of times, being able to accomplish something at super speed by just putting it into digital and doing it there at 10x or 100x. Imagine copying someone's consciousness into the VR and uh, interrogating them a hundred times over and restarting it. Although, if you could do that, couldn't you just literally read their mind? They're a digital construct, so you it could is possible pick it apart and just read it. It's possible to have the brain data and an emulator that works with it and not know how the brain actually works internally, like how to access the structure. You're working with the outputs. So you don't necessarily know what's on the inside. I feel like if you could map every single aspect of the brain, you could probably plot out how it works and then extract information from it. I would hope so, but I don't think it's necessarily something that comes together, necessarily. In the <coughs> Commonwealth Saga that I had recommended previously in one of our episodes, it's actually a form of human ascension, is to download your consciousness into a computer and you would live in a virtual simulation of your own, of your own design. And they had where you could go back and forth in between. You could grow a new body. Oh, okay. And then if so- you wanted a physical, but that was also considered drastically reducing the scope of your your intellect and abilities by doing that to go human yeah i can see that happening one day that's crazy i can also see in the takeshi kovach series in altered carbon there are romantic scenes using the vr i feel like a big push into this technology is going to be from pornography you think it's going to be similar as depicted in lawnmower man (laughs) maybe not like lawnmower man i that was not believable for me but like we talked about this before it's remarkable how much technology is pushed by pornography Sure. VHS over beta. The v- internet was a big push. Blu-ray over HD DVD. It's crazy the kind of pull that the industry winds up having at the end. That's a multi-billion dollar industry. Huge. And it's it's funny. It's just, it's a giant industry that makes all the money that everyone tries to ignore when they're not being gross. <laughs> <laughs> and funnily, has to be somewhat at the forefront for technology to keep up, to separate itself from competitors. Yeah. So I wonder where that's going to come into all this, because maybe that's going to be the big thing. I was talking about industry. We're talking about video games, like who maybe training people in the army and space, or maybe it'll just be porn. Pornography will be the killer app that makes VR explode. At least consumer driven. Consumer driven. And then they can get rid of those creepy real dolls. Or they'll just become creepier. (laughs) Maybe. Well, that's the funny thing, is the blend of virtual reality and the distinction between augmented reality is at what level do those two separate from one another, and when do they merge? Seems pretty clear, if you're seeing any of the real world. Well, if you want to include tactile feedback or sensory input Mm. versus, you know, purely just virtual experience. Augmented reality as the gateway, until we can actually create sensory feedback in a virtual reality, augmented reality will be the i would imagine more favored approach i tend to think of augmented reality as immersive i tend to think of augmented reality as a thing that's just good and better and i want it like that's very clearly useful yeah but imagine hard to imagine a day when virtual reality can simulate touch and and smell holodeck yeah but not necessarily even in that format where it could just be specific electrical signals that are fed to you right we might be talking like into your spinal cord at that point or a full suit that you wear might be a little ways off there's actually there's this i don't think it started yet and we'll link to in the show notes when i find out where it is and what it is and put that link in decipher7.com slash eight there's a place i don't know what even to call it i think a theme park i guess it's they have like this warehouse where they outfitted it with stuff to walk in and touch and created a virtual world that is an exact match for the physical space they created so that you can put the headset on and go and play say a a video game where you're attacked by monsters and it matches the stuff in the real world so there actually is a box here there actually is a wall there actually are spider webs or whatever but i kind of see that as augmented reality that's what i'm getting at because you can actually pick up the represent- uh, representation of a torch and you hold it up to cast light further or you have an axe which is a piece of styrofoam and you can throw that right and that you could even incorporate i don't know if they're doing it in this place you could even incorporate actors like the people you have in a haunted house could be 
dolled up to be represented in real time in your view. But yeah, maybe that's the interim for games uh, before we combine into a full sensory because we're a long way from sticking into the brainstem before we combine full sensory input. That seems like it might be kind of cool, and I hope that succeeds. Like, I'd like to go one day. It could be like the next level, Escape This Room, except it's a Escape This Dungeon with monsters. But too much of that. Do you worry we might become like Lawnmower Man? Who can tell? I mean, he had a bunch of brain-altering drugs injected to him, so who can say exactly how you react when you're physically or physiologically augmented? Right, so is he kind of evil inside the whole time? Or was it just too much, and he cracked under the pressure, and that's what happened? Or is the message here that, like, technology is evil or something? Is that where we're going? I think he was given too much power without the wisdom to handle it appropriately. That seems about right. As he struck out at those who struck at him and sought revenge with his newfound power. Way out of proportion to the offenses committed. So you could just see him as someone who was unemotionally immature enough to handle the power that he received. Even with the intellect that he developed very suddenly still might not have any emotional immature right the emotional maturity to handle it without being an evil well, psychopath that's the difference it's the difference between intelligence and wisdom and that's actually brought up it says that it has to be tempered with wisdom all the power that he had there was something along the lines of man mankind can evolve a thousand fold through this but it needs to be tempered by wisdom right and he was like Rrr! and he just smashed everything with his <laughs> yeah. mind powers your naive ignorance makes me angry so he got there somehow virtual reality is magic i guess Combined with crazy nootropic brain drugs, which isn't, a, well, it, it was sci-fi in the movie, but those are real. Like, we actually have things that affect the way our brains function. And it seemed like the virtual reality was a mechanism to directly alter lo the lumber man's mind itself. He could actually pick specific parts of his brain to augment or to target with new information or whatever the program was. I know Kung Fu. Essentially. I know telekinesis. I saw God. Is that what he said? Yes, at one point in time. Yeah, it must have been dramatic. So it seemed not only as it was virtual reality, but the machine was capable of directly interacting with parts of the brain itself. Yeah, I, I guess the virtual reality, we could justify it as like a representation of a deeper process that was happening medically, biologically to him in that machine that wasn't really explained. So why not? So he's Job. He loves the lawn. Then he's Super Job with telekinesis. Then he's really angry Murder Job with even more telekinesis, who makes people disintegrate. And then... Joe goes full singularity on us. Yes, quite literally. There was actually, you even said it. We were watching the movie. You were like, hey, singularity. He even, <laughs> he like is spaghettified, stretched out into like a virtual representation of a single, of a black hole, a singularity. Mm -hmm. And that was his entering virtual reality in totality. I, I don't know if it was on purpose, but that imagery and the analogy was really good. I feel like it might have even been an accident. Yeah, they may have been aiming for a whirlpool or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. right. But a drain of some variety. If we think of Werner Vinga's definition of the singularity, the original definition of the singularity, which is a little bit muddled with futurism stuff it's making an analogy between when ai develops it hits a point where once it is there a general intelligence we no longer can make any guesses about what will happen like looking forward into time there is a singularity where just as a black hole no light escapes we have no idea what comes after this point so that's the analogy for the singularity they maybe accidentally make the singularity for job in the movie and that's when he's in the computer and yeah, well, we do have no idea what he will do once he is there. And apparently, will, well, he can, will he control all technology in the world? Will he be the benevolent technology god? Yeah, he was saying we needed like guidance and and monitor. He said he, like he had to take care of us, like we're dumb children. Will he do a bad job? Well, Probably, right? <laughs> yeah, being that he is vindictive and extremely aggressive, it seems like he won't be the most even-handed of rulers. So that, that really cheesy but wonderful scene of him trying to open all the ports <laughs> and putting his hand into each one and getting angry that it's locked. Those are handshakes, by the way. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That that I didn't realize the analogy there, but that's really funny. <laughs> hey, it's, it's different I.O. ports that he's trying to open up. Truly the most efficient way is to use your hands. Well, it's a representation. Just think in community when he wants to go delete the file. You gotta, you know, <laughs> like rinse it in the, the fountain first and like shoot a flaming arrow at it. <laughs> that's, that's what they're making fun of is this virtual reality in movies in the 90s, which was Lawnmower Man mostly, where actions had to take the long drawn out physical analogy way too far, even though it was so inefficient. Instead of having a context menu on things like, I'm just going to hold down on this and then I can delete directly. Or even or... just having like, I think it because I'm a intelligence inside a machine and it happens. But either way, it's good that he was slowed down by that because he had to push all the buttons before we got to the end and actually escaped into the world. By very happily finding a back door. Right. He was like, aha, a back door. <laughs> And then the movie ends with him ringing all the phones, presumably. Well, that 
he had said that that would be his birth cry, where all the phones in the world ringing. Oh, did he? I forgot. Yes. Okay, so they had alluded to what would come, and then it did. And so he... That's why it was extra ominous at right. the end. Maybe in 1992, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff for him to control compared to, like, now. Think about it. Where almost everything is internet accessible. Now? Yeah, yeah. Like, internet of Things. IPv6. We can have every object that we own in the whole world well, with an IP that, address. Your lights are controlled now. You know, your, your thermostat. You can have your fridge. Let's go through your house. Yeah, you have a fridge. You have these lights on the ceiling are Wi-Fi controlled. You have a Nest. There's a bunch of game consoles. There's a TV thing. You have that bidet might even be computer controlled. It's, it's awesome. Not, but that would be... Uh, I don't believe you. <laughs> you could probably turn on the oven or the dishwasher. Man, and the house locks and the cameras. This is in a normal dude's house. This isn't like Bill Gates' mansion. So now imagine yeah, now... If I were rich, every, every part would be like that. And then imagine now, Joe gets out in the world where everything's actually connected. We'd be so screwed. Yeah, he could change my lights on me, make my house uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> The bidet will be going bonkers. <laughs> Everything will be all wet. <laughs> I think we have more than 5,000 databases now. Yes. <laughs> he had really high goals for the time, I guess. And then, so he's controlling the phones. But, like, what are you going to do? The stock market or something? Like, I don't know. Physical control of the world was not available to him to a large degree. Now it would be. Although, I mean, even at the time, he would have had... Uh, oh, the control software? Yeah, that existed. So industrial control software actually would have been available to him. But still... A lot more opportunity now. Although those typically aren't networked. They're not typically networked, but the United States and Israeli governments are able to get across the air gap, then so can Job. Well, fortunately, people aren't very good about security. I mean, fortunately for the person getting in. a USB in. stick in the parking lot and people are like, ooh, what's this? And plug it in. <laughs> ooh, piece of candy. Pretty much. But our power grids, for instance, those are, I think, accessible by the internet. Right. And Sabotage I wonder for them. how it was in 1982, but now we'd be extra super screwed. We need energy. We're not all on solar yet. Actually, we need even smarter grids than we currently do. It's, our infrastructure is particularly at risk. Right. We should definitely fix that up for when the AI takes over well, so they have better material to work with. Is that what you're saying? No, even if even without the AI, some work should go into it. Probably. For sure. Yeah. It's huge and it's not an exciting thing politically. I can see how that doesn't get done. Yeah, there's no ribbon cutting when you do planned maintenance for something. Like people already talk, politically, we already talk about how bridges are not exciting and it's hard to get like road infrastructure done. You don't see the energy infrastructure at all. That's even harder. That's an even harder sell for the public. And I have to say, it kind of seems like it was a step backwards for Job going into virtual reality. Good point, now that you mention it. Yeah, he was actually able to have a floating giant head and disintegrate people at will, and now he can ring phones. Well, yeah, he had not only telekinesis, but the ability to create objects and matter and affect things. So it would appear, at yeah. Distance at a fundamental level, not just like push them around. And then he went to... I mean, he did push the lawnmower with his mind and ate squeeze people. Squeeze the tube of toothpaste, yeah. Squeeze the tube. <laughs> his start, start small. Made a, you know, a bunch of virtual bees. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> no, but that seemed to me like a step backwards for his capabilities. Yeah, he's able to get farther now, but now he can't. He's Like I said, now he's going to ring the phone. Like, what is he going to do? Although, he is potentially immortal. That is gained. nice. So maybe his best move would be to hide out until 2015 when everything's on the internet. And he's just going to troll people in the interim. Maybe he's been like those people on YouTube. That's actually Job. I like to think that the world is not that bad, and that's the explanation for it. <laughs> <clears throat> Some super intelligent virtual reality that just has a, a bone to pick with people. So Job goes into a computer, and then Pierce Brosnan gets to continue to do unethical research unhindered to someone else. Well, you have to think, it wasn't completely his fault. He was creating the protocol, but they had seen with the, the chimpanzee in the beginning that was super aggressive. He was upset that they wanted to test Program 5, or whatever its name was, on Job. When Job was seeing the results that he was from the experiments, because but, Program 5 was aggressive. That chimp went crazy and started shooting people and tried to escape. Which was a wonderful sequence that we've overlooked in talking about the movie. And that's kind of where Job went off the deep end, is when they applied that to him. Yeah, sure. So I forgot, actually, talking about whether he was evil or whatever. It was probably the fault of whatever aggression drug. But... Pierce Brosnan is the one who took a guy who was not legally capable of making a decision and signed him up for a medical trial. His fault. Thanks a lot, Pierce Brosnan. Well, I would say giant Hank face saying, inject him with five or whatever it was. <laughs> that, that kind of... Shared responsibility. Well, I'm not saying he's blameless in the entire thing. Just he may not be the most at fault. I just hope Pierce Brosnan will like get permission the next time from a, a person who is a legal adult who can do that. Or actually complete his trials first. And that's if Job doesn't get him first. Which I have to say, the opening sequence kind of reminded me of the Doom movie. So you had the uh, first-person chimp cam going around. I want to maybe make a collection of first-person movie scenes. First-person movie scenes, because I really enjoy them. It was first-person chimp with Terminator overlay. There's first-person chimp with Terminator overlay. There's uh, Doom, which 
Ser- I'm not even joking. Is like one of my favorite things. I love it. So good. Especially the first person shooter scene. Strange Days is another one we're going to have to cover. Do you remember that? No. Awesome. Anyway, we shouldn't get into too long of a list. We should wrap this up. So what did we learn? If you do modify someone and they become super intelligent, angry, and can manipulate matter at a distance, or even just close up, and they want to go into a virtual reality, do some proper sandboxing. That would be good security policy. Yes. I agree. I don't have anything to add. That was too succinct. So that's what I've learned. We should move on to talk about the recommended related media. So as we have mentioned, there is Community, which covers a wide variety of topics in a humorous manner, but specifically... You're really selling it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a little too dry? <laughs> it's a little dry. It's actually, the show is, you, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have seen Community. It's super funny. It's super great. They lampoon a lot of pop culture stuff, and being our age, we appreciate that they spend time making fun of like the 80s and 90s and stuff that we grew up with a lot of the time because that's how old the people are making the show. They know it and they, they do it all really lovingly, including the episode that you're probably just about to mention very directly. Yes, One More Maintenance and Postnatal Care. Right, <laughs> which is the movie where they basically lampoon Lawnmower Men. There is also a series of books that was recommended to me by none other than Chris himself. So Demon and Freedom TM. Right, okay. So Daniel Suarez wrote these books, right? Demon, D-A-M-O-N. Did I say the right... D-A-E-M-O-N, like a computer demon, FYI, so don't have trouble searching for that. It does really interesting things with Internet of Things type controlling the world from computers like we're talking about and uh, augmented reality. So please be aware that the first book and the second book have wildly different tones. This is the part where he forgets that I told him this before he read them and he seems unhappy with me somehow. Mm. The first was fun, but then the second one just, it just went a little too far. Okay, so the second one went off the rails, but I really dug it. It was crazy nuts and really fun, and it's I, almost kind of hard to believe they're from the same story. But I, I really enjoy both of them. Demon, at least, is a really good thriller covering like possible use of AR. Well, not only that, but also seems to have a somewhat reasonable approach to technology. So he himself, he had a lot of research, or he had researchers that were heavily invested in technology, giving me advice on the book. Oh, that's a really good idea. Okay, I'm, gl- I'm, I'm not surprised, because he handles it all really well. Even when it goes off the deep end, it's based on entirely reasonable premises. And this guy is, maybe he did something similar to what we do. He was an IT professional, and maybe is now, in between novels. And it's the only book I recall reading, well, like, like this, where one of the characters has a favorite sequel injection attack. So. <laughs> I don't recall that. But yeah, you don't see that in a lot of movies. No. Or books. This, usually, yeah. usually it's, you know, projector screen, code against the face, some music. Yeah, I actually heard about the book series to begin with on the Security Now podcast, where I tend to hear about good, like, hard sci-fi. And I'd say this falls into that realm. Knowing how computers actually work to a degree, I was satisfied with it a lot. Even when it went off the deep end in Freedom TM, still, premise is reasonable. Just crazy. And you know what, man? Maybe in 10 years we'll see it. It'll look just like the book and we'll be wrong. Hopefully not. I also mentioned the Takeshi Kovach book series by Richard K. Morgan. The first book being Alter Carbon and the one I most heartily recommend. You haven't read this yet, but you probably should. It's really neat, gritty detective noir stuff in the future, cyberpunk. A lot of people smoking because it's all like gritty detective stuff and you have to have that. But it has lots of virtual reality, lots of AI stuff, lots of body swapping, consciousness moving around, storage stuff. Really cool. Sounds neat. It was. You can get all the stuff we just talked about in the show notes, if you'd like. DecipherSciFi.com slash 8 would be the place to look. So we just recommended good stuff. Three good things, and maybe even more. You can get to them from the show notes at DecipherSciFi.com slash 8. You should also check out DecipherSciFi.com slash subscribe to subscribe to the podcast if you have not done so already. On the subscribe page, you can get to our Instagram account where we post a lot of really cool sci-fi inspirational stuff and even clips from the movies that we cover on the show. It's also where we get a lot of the ideas for what we should watch and what we should talk about. So in this instance in particular, at Astronomy Reloaded is an account where a person posts lots of pictures from their telescopes of the sky. They're really cool. I follow him and like all of his stuff, and you should too. He's the one who started me talking about VR, and that's why we're talking about this movie. Thanks, person from internet. So I guess it's time to cut the network connections and sign off. Ah, a back door. To the internet.